Welcome to Distribution Talk with Jason Bader, the show where we dive into the stories, struggles, and solutions from business owners and thought leaders in the wholesale distribution market. Hi, friends. Jason here. In this episode, I had the opportunity to catch up with Joe Barr, Director of Business Development with Global Logistics Incorporated. GLI is a freight and logistics consulting firm based in Portland, Oregon. There are several freight brokers out there promising to cut your freight rates, but GLI is a little bit different. They actually come in and analyze your business to come up with solutions. Joe and I have been friends for years, and I've had him come speak at several of my seminars. I enjoyed our conversation, and I hope you do too. All right. Hey, Joe, uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your, uh, your time on this. Well, thank you for inviting me, Jason. You've listened to a couple of the episodes, so you kind of know what we're all about. And you and I've been around a long time. You know, we've uh, we, we've shared some ideas, and uh, you've presented at some of the seminars uh, over the years. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved with the uh, logistics business, freight, all that. Where did that all start for you? Well, it all started my senior year of college. I was hired on as a seasonal employee at UPS as a temporary, and wound up rolling that into a part-time job. And within a year, I went from working inside the hub to a intern, to a package car driver and full-time supervisor. I rolled into business development from there and was a sales manager for a period of time. My last job there was national account manager. And I left the company at the end of 1997 after my manager flew up from California and told me that I was going to be promoted again and relocated. And that was not something I could do at that point. Got it. What a great job, though, for a college kid, you know, getting in there and doing the seasonal work. I mean, to this day, I still think that's one of those uh, dream jobs, you know, that I remember when I was in school. It's like, man, those guys always they were killing it. So that was a pretty, pretty good gig for you there. Yeah, it was great because, you you know, you earned money and you're basically working out. So it's like a right. hour workout every day. Absolutely. That's that's exactly it. You know, and, and it was that or Costco, you know, one of those two jobs. Those are like the premier jobs. Exactly. Uh, when you were in college. So you left uh, UPS, decided not to relocate. Then uh, where'd you go next? After that, one of my old clients from UPS was a company called NTP Distribution, which was an RV parts distributor based yeah. primarily out of the Northwest, had some roots in the uh, Elkhart, Indiana area. And then they had a facility in Ontario, California. I went to work there as a marketing manager, publications manager. And then we started a merchandising department. I also ran that department. So my exposure to GLI actually came from working at NTP. Gotcha. And for those of us who don't know GLI, Global, was it Global Logistics uh, Incorporated? Yes, I'm sorry. Global Logistics. Okay, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Tell us a little bit about Global Logistics. What does Global Logistics do? Global Logistics is a fourth party logistics provider that designs, implements, and manages great programs for manufacturers, distributors, and direct-to-consumer companies. And you've been doing that how long now? 18 years. Wow. So, uh, yeah, you've seen a couple things, been exposed to a few changes over the years? I have. If you wouldn't mind, tell us what's going on in the freight world. Really, what should distributors really think about? And what should they know about some of the changes that are going on in freight and logistics? Uh, just to kind of give them an idea of, of what they're what they're looking at coming forward here. Well, the industry has changed quite a bit. The market conditions have changed quite a bit over the last 12 to 18 months. Part of it is due to driver shortages. One, in the truckload market, uh, the government required the installation of an electronic logging device, ELD. And with that, the drivers were now under the watchful eye of the government. And if they ran late in their hours on road, they're fined. And so many of them chose to just quit at that point or retire because they were making about a third less income than they were previous to the ELD monitoring system. The second big area is the uh, issue of staffing. Uh, The staffing, not only from the driver's perspective, but also from the terminal operations, hub operations in both freight and parcel. So what's happening there is this generation just doesn't want to work manual labor. Mm -hmm. So they're having serious turnover and uh, serious challenges with getting the right people to work. My understanding is that there's, you know, this huge deficit coming forward of, you know, drivers, capable drivers. You know, I, I remember hearing some statistic like 70,000 open jobs, you know, coming up, uh, you know, in the trucking industry. I mean, that's really going to put a strain on 
movement of product and movement of freight around. Exactly. I think your number is very, very accurate. Yeah. And the number is growing. The real change that will reduce this major problem will be in 2025. That's about the time when they're going to have driverless trucks over the road uh, or a lead driver with two trucks behind them being uh, operated by that front driver. Oh, interesting. So it'll be, you know, uh, almost like a remote, it'll exactly. almost be like a train, but, you know, kind of a little bit different there. Interesting. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Yeah, yeah it's kind yeah. of fascinating. You figure, uh, really, we're only, what, five, six years away from that. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, they're, they're testing right now. They've done open road testing on it. But as you know, the whole driverless issue is a very serious one sure. in terms of accidents, liability for the carriers and things. So they're going to make absolute sure that it's working properly. Yeah, definitely a, you know, scary. You know, you're talking about a very big vehicle here. And to not have a driver in direct control of it, I mean, that's just, uh, yeah, there, there is some fear associated with that for sure. For sure, yes. So what are some of the other things besides a shortage in labor, shortage in drivers? What else should uh, the industry expect? Well, besides uh, demand outseating supply right now, there's also some big changes in how carriers price things and rates are definitely going up not only from the, the driver shortage, but also from uh, what they call weight and inspections. The LTL industry especially is using more auditors than they've ever used before to look at the bills of lading when they come in to make sure that the weight of the what is recorded is actually what the actual weight is. Since freight is classified, they're also using dimensionalizing equipment that will actually shoot the dimensions of the shipment. And if it's not meeting the proper pounds per cubic foot, for that particular product classifications, they will reclassify it at a higher class, which is a higher rate. So that's become a serious issue with rate increases coming up. We spend a lot of time at Global working to fight those because in many cases, they're not correct. And uh, in many cases, I would suspect that uh, shippers, they don't want to take the time to audit that and take a look at that. And they, they just as soon just kind of pay it and move on. Right. Our suggestion is just make sure your bill of lading is correct when you start. And mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't have any problems. One of the things I hear from wholesale distribution companies in particular is the fact that rates are going up more and more every year. Now, the industry always has an annual rate increase, but it's how they rate the lanes in which you ship in that really makes the difference. So if they announce a 4.9% increase, it's never 4.9% for a shipper because what they do is they rate zip code to zip code for every possible zip code scenario in the United States, okay? So in some areas where there's no freight going, they may reduce the rates by 2%. But in heavier lanes of traffic, they might increase the rates by 10% or 15%. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example of that. We were working with a new company, and one of his issues was the fact that he never met budget on his, on his freight. And I asked him how he was budgeting for freight. He said, well, they say 4.9% every year. I take this year's budget. I increase it by 4.9%. And that's what I uh, budget for the next year. So we got into his freight analysis and we realized that on his inbound freight, which was a lot of his freight cost, the two largest lanes he was shipping from had a 19% and a 21% increase in the previous two years. So that's exactly why he sure. wasn't. Oh yeah, for sure. Year. It's a tricky little situation. So when you get a rate increase, you know, you really need to analyze it based on the lanes that you ship to, to see what the overall impact is going to be. Some carriers will offer you that information proactively. Some of the parcel carriers mm -hmm. will, but for the most part, they don't do that. Okay, I got you. If I could, just uh, you know, kind of uh, changing tacks here. You and I have talked over the years about inbound freight, and this has been kind of one of those things that it's kind of a foreign concept to distributors. Uh, you know, they always kind of thought that, well, I can't control inbound freight. You know, that's really the purview of the shipper or uh, the manufacturer who they buy from. So talk a little bit about that. Well, the fact that freight is free is a myth, quite Absolutely. honestly. There is no such thing as free freight. And I think most distributors are aware of that. But there are many benefits to inbound freight management. So let me go back to my days at NTP. One of the things that Global Logistics did was work with our purchasing people to try to get as many suppliers as possible switched over to in uh, freight collect. So we were paying the freight on the inbound. There's a method to that, and I can explain that in a little sure, bit. But sure. let me go back to what we did specifically. By looking at the vendors that were really gouging us on freight, 
we were able to reduce our cost by $170,000 net the first year by taking over our freight. A pretty substantial uh, savings there. I mean, yeah. exactly. The other benefit to that was that we received a lot of operational efficiencies. We are a very seasonal company, so we reduce right. the amount of carriers coming into us every day, which streamlined our receiving process. With that streamlined process, we were also able to have a faster put-away rate mm -hmm. of our inventory that was coming in, which gave us a better fill mm -hmm. rate. And in that particular industry, you could have a brass washer that the customer wants you know, as part of his order, and if we don't have it in stock, He'll give his entire order to the competition that day. And it could be a $5,000 order where he ordered, you know, awnings and other things as a result. Right, right. Explain to me how this whole thing works. Because, I mean, we, when most of us set up our replenishment systems, you know, in distribution, I mean, it's pretty common that, you know, as you said, you know, free freight tends to be this mantra. Everybody tries to make free freight and it is not really free. So how do you approach this supplier? I mean, how do you say, hey, wait a minute, I'd rather not take free freight I'm going to go ahead and pay the freight myself. I mean, really, this is a really foreign territory for a lot of people. Right. The hardest part is analyzing what your inbound freight cost is. So you have to do a lot of analysis prior to approaching that particular supplier by looking at the weight of the shipments coming in, uh, where they're coming from, what you think you can get in terms of freight cost on those. Mm -hmm. And then if you see in a situation, for example, prepay an ad, it's a pretty easy way to compare it, and then you can make that switch. So in that case, for prepay and ad, you simply just tell the supplier, look, I'm going to go ahead and take over the freight from here. It gets a little bit more tricky when you get into prepaid freight. Mm -hmm. And prepaid freight is where you, you really have to do back and forth negotiations with the supplier in order to achieve what you want to achieve. Because in that particular case, you are trying to get a benefit to the inbound freight, not only taking it over, but also getting a better product price at the same time. So you absolutely have to nail down what your anticipated inbound freight cost would be before you can go to the supplier and say, look, I'll take over the freight on this, but I need a 4% additional discount on the product itself. Right, right. The problem is with it is that a lot of distributors simply don't have the time to do this type of analysis. So that's where they get hung up is that um, it takes a lot of time and effort to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it sounds like that's the biggest barrier right there is that exactly. number one, they don't want to do it, but number two, they probably don't know how to do it. I mean, that that's even further. I mean, it's just, you know, how do I, and, you know, would I analyze this kind of stuff? How would I try to figure out, you know, what are those rates in between, you know, manufacturer X and myself? Is it always coming from the same location? I mean, there's there's a little bit of that as well. Would you start with a big supplier to you or would you start with somebody who's maybe a little smaller? If you were going to go in and, and take a shot at this? Well, you know, we suggest always going for the low-hanging fruit, and that's the freight collect. Okay. So that's pretty easy. Just take it over. Prepay and add is the next step, and then prepay it is after that. I would definitely recommend that you do this small to large. Okay. And the reason why is, first of all, you got to see if your analysis is correct and that you're actually coming out ahead. And also, quite honestly, some of the suppliers you may be buying from have better rates than you could ever get. Right, right. And in that particular case, you just kind of want to leave it where it is. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I could see that. One of the things you've been mentioning here, you know, freight collect, prepay and add. Can you explain that to us a little bit? Uh, what does prepay and add mean? Prepay and add means that the supplier charges you for the product itself, and then there's a line item for freight. Okay, okay. So they add to it. Now, most suppliers will buffer that a little okay. bit. Okay. They'll, they'll bump it up 10%. On the parcel side of things, the industry norm is typically to just charge published rates. And so, you know, if you can switch that over, you're going to see an obvious gain right from the get-go. Right, because most people will, you know, their small parcel rate is going to be a percentage less than that published rate. Right. The analysis still has to be done, though, to determine whether or not they are actually charging you published rate or more. Theoretically, you could also get rid of the handling charge as well, because that's easier. They're not having to fill out all the paperwork that they need to on, for example, freight shipments. Okay. You go through this, and as you said, probably you want to start with, it, obviously, freight collects first, and then prepay an ad because it's a line item. It's easy to look at. You know, the tougher ones are going to be those 
where it's bundled in. It's This is a freight prepaid. I mean, that's just, it's buried in there. With that, how do you yank out that piece for, for freight? Well, again, you have to look at the weight of the shipments that are coming into yeah. you. And then kind of like the same process with prepay and add. However, suppliers will sell to you for you to get free freight because that amount of product is beneficial at that level, obviously, to, to ship to mm-hmm. you. So that's why they're offering that incentive. You buy more product and we'll pay the freight on it. Well, as you know, and wholesale dis- distributors know, you have to look at how long that product is sitting on the shelf right. uh, and determine from there then, is it worth it to buy? So one of the things, for example, that Global does is we work with purchasing people on trying to determine when to go for the free freight and when not to. Um, in some cases, if they don't have enough turns on that particular inventory, then it's better to buy where you pay the freight on it because overall, as you know, it's going to be beneficial to the company. Sure. I mean, you're, you're not going to incur that carrying cost, you know, for hanging on to a large shipment and you're not overbuying, overburdening your system. It could be overburdening your warehouse and you're receiving people and whatnot. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Can you tell me a story, uh, somebody who actually went through the process and I mean, obviously no names, I'm not going to ask for names, of course, but uh, somebody who has really benefited from moving from this traditional freight prepaid, or I'm basically at the whim of the supplier, to I'm going to start controlling my inbound freight and uh, see if I can find a couple nickels on the ground. Well, it is. It's a change in culture and a change in thought for many distributors because they've used the same model for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of things they have to do. It absolutely has to be sold from the top down and mandated that this is the effort we're going to put in. So that, for example, if you have branches, right. that the branches are following routing instructions, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where it can get a little more difficult because most branch managers try to run their branches kind of like their own little sure. business. So the buy-in is a big, big part of it. Uh, the second is the analysis and being able to, to have the time to mm-hmm. do it. And again, a lot of companies just don't have the resources to do that. You know, so again, working with one of your clients, I mean, are we talking about you know, being able to save uh, $100,000, $10,000. I mean, obviously it depends on the size of the company and the amount of inbound purchases they're making. But is this a significant uh, amount of money that these folks can save? Absolutely. Like I mentioned uh, that my previous company saved $170,000 net in the first year. Yeah. And that was after paying us for doing all the analysis. Work. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, yeah. So for a wholesale distributor to drop 170 grand to the bottom line when you're Five percent EBITDA, you know. If that, I mean, most people, you know, exactly. three to five at best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. That's huge. That money. is huge money. So, you know, I remember you shared this with me. It's got to be a good ten years ago or something like that. You know, it's been quite a few years ago. You you threw this out there, and I thought, wow, I have never been exposed to that before. So, and I think a lot of the um, uh, distributors I work with, and maybe a lot of listeners, have never really understood that they could, you know, manage that themselves. Or at least, you know, dare I say, hire someone in to help them, you know, create that, do that kind of analysis work. But this is a real opportunity for them to pick up some money at the bottom line. It is. It really is. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of hard work, especially when you start getting into the prepaid scenarios. But, you know, like I said, start small to see how you're doing. Then uh, if you see that it's actually working the way you want it to, then you can start going after some of the larger suppliers. But there are some, again, that their program's going to be better than anything you can put together. So there's cases where you just need to simply leave it the way it is. And there's also situations where large suppliers they say, you know what, we're not going to do that. Right. We want to control how many trucks come in and out of our shipping dock every day. So no, that's not going to happen. Go buy your product elsewhere. Yeah. We made some hard decisions, and you have to make some hard decisions as a, as a distributor when you start getting into this, because in some cases, you may find that you have, during this analysis, that you have a lot of duplicate suppliers. Oh, yeah. And so with that, maybe one wants to do it and one doesn't want to do it. So you may have to make the hard decision. Well, if you're not going to do it, then I'm simply going to have to move the rest of that business over to my other supplier. And, and consolidate. Yeah, pretty common that distributors do have multiple lines of product that do pretty much the same darn thing. And uh, a lot of those decisions on which one they're going to support become, you know, they're very subjective. And they don't look at the math side. They don't look at the financial impact of 
choosing one supplier over another it becomes very emotionally based. It's uh, oh, my customer loves these guys or et cetera. So I like the rep, whatever, whatever emotionally based or subjective decision making occurs. But when you start to apply the financial analysis and it could be either, you know, the freight side, it could be, I like to look at the return on investment side, but you know, those are different pieces of analysis, you know, and yes, there's going to be are. a couple Maybe uh, suppliers are going to be on the outside looking in. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, relationships are important. Obviously, you're purchasing people. Try to build good quality relationships mm -hmm. with your suppliers. But the bottom line is the suppliers are trying to make money. And so when they're trying to make money, then sometimes you have to make some hard decisions. You know, and we can't kid ourselves. The suppliers are not in business to make you money as a distributor. You know, that is not what they're in business to do. They're in business to make themselves money. And do they do things that will enhance your business? Of course they do. That's part of that relationship back and forth. But make no mistake, they are in business to make money for their entity, not for yours. Yeah, exactly. Especially on the prepaid side, there are situations where, you know, some of the suppliers feel like you're telling them that you're being cheated. And that's really not the case. It's that you're trying to use your economies of scale. Because once you control your inbound freight, your outbound freight costs can go down because you have more volume and revenue to give to the carriers. Right. So by doing that, you can get better outbound prices by renegotiating your carrier contract with that additional business. Interesting. So yeah, there we go. There's a little bit of a domino effect there. You know, freight's one of those huge expenses that I think that distributors would love to tackle. They'd love to take this on. They just don't know how to get their arms around it. I mean, honestly, right. if you look at the income statement for most uh, distributors, it's at least number two or three on the list, you know, for top expenses. I mean, it is a big, big deal. So I think this is something that uh, is extremely worthwhile. Now, I remember you used to talk about a job title called a traffic manager. Is that still somebody that's uh, pretty prevalent in, in wholesale distribution? Yes, the traffic manager is basically the person that oversees shipping and receiving. Okay. Uh, now they can they can fall under operations manager. Uh, a lot of people are changing traffic to logistics just because as we progress through outlife. It's a pretty word, you know. It's just you know, it's yeah, it's a nice yeah. title, yeah. It's a little more sophisticated than traffic, and and oftentimes, you know, when you tell somebody you're a traffic manager, they're like, oh, so you work for the city planning? And yeah, stuff yeah, on traffic? yeah. You know, so it, it's kind of a vague term until it's getting more defined now by using the, the word logistics. Okay, I got gotcha. you. And this would be the person probably that is going to do this kind of analysis, right? This is going to spend a little time here. Yes, the person that's in charge of logistics as well as purchasing. Okay. And, you know, going back to when we did our program, our team met every Tuesday. And we took, you know, okay, we're going to talk about these particular suppliers on this day. So people did their homework, and then they would come in on that following Tuesday, and they would lay out, okay, this is what I found out. Do we think we can do this? And if so, then purchasing is assigned to go back, contact the supplier, and make it happen. Gotcha. Do you ever see CFOs get involved with this kind of work, or controllers, or, or that uh, the accounting side of the business? Yes, they are. In fact, our company president actually got involved in most of the weekly meetings as well. It's very important to have the financial side covered because sometimes it's easier for the CFO to make the harder decision. Gotcha. So, it, you know, then the purchasing people, or they can save face a little bit, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, hey, it was, a, it was a decision made by the entire organization, it wasn't just me, so that they can try to keep their relationship. But for the most part, the person that they're dealing with on the phone is a salesperson or inside sales. So that person doesn't take it too personally. Mm -hmm. I mean, on occasion it does, but most of the time they don't. I got you. It's just business. Okay. Okay. Good. If someone wants to go down this trail, Joe, I mean, uh, you, you've kind of made a couple suggestions about where to start, but I mean, ultimately talking about you and your business, how does someone engage a company like yours or you, know, you or somebody else? I mean, first of all, how do they find you or someone like you? Well, that's a good question. We have a small company. Uh, we work with 40 to 50 clients at a time. Most of what you see in the industry are third-party logistics companies. So brokers, forwarders, rate resellers, they will say, yes, we can help you with this. And in some cases they can, 
but you really need to go to a fourth party logistics company because they are focusing on the entire company's profitability. So they tend to work more within the entire organization rather than just with shipping and receiving. Got it. Okay. So- and also they have the resources, you know, they, they're non-asset based. Four PLs are non-asset based. They have a principle of neutrality when it comes to carriers, whereas brokers may lean towards one particular carrier because they make more money sure. off it. Commission um, thing, yeah, exactly. So you know you have to finding a true fourth party. The industry is expanding. I I know that when I started in it back in two thousand and one, I didn't even know what a fourth party was, and my exposure at UPS was just third parties who'd wanted to negotiate rates with us. Yeah. What I saw when I witnessed what Global was doing uh, totally changed my attitude about what logistics companies can do, what outside logistics companies can do for uh, companies. And so I was really sold on it. And, and that's exactly why I got back into the industry was because I was so impressed with what Global did with our particular company yeah. that I really wanted to be a part of that. Google is the best way to go. If you're looking for somebody, uh, our company works with people from all over the country and we import and export product all over the world. That's a shameless plug right yeah, there. No, but, no. Uh, it's, <laughs> and actually, I was going to ask you, the website, it's a little little unusual uh, you know, URL. So maybe if you could share that with the audience, uh, how to reach. And I'm this will go into the show notes, of course, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, maybe just to share with them where they can go find you. Well, our website name is wwwg l dash i.com a dash is a hype yeah so uh that's how it was you know um our previous it director came up with that and if we could go back and change it we could but uh <laughs> we have a lot of people relying on that now so sure. it's really hard to go back and change so good and if i understand the way that you all work is uh that they contract with you and uh then they pay either, was it a flat rate or is it based on the amount of savings? How does that work uh, in your model? There's many different oh, okay. ways that we can be paid along. It can be a monthly fee. It can be transactional. It can be uh, a portion of savings. Most people like to start with that yeah. simply because it's a no-lose situation that sure, way. Sure, sure. If, if the shipment was $100 before and now it's 80 you get $10 you know, that as a starting and then the percentage changes over time. Right. Uh, but if it was a hundred dollars before and it's 110, we lose five dollars on that. Gotcha. But we have to balance that. We only work with companies that understand that service comes before price. Because anytime you work with a company that's simply price based, it's like the mechanic adage, good, cheap, or fast, pick two. Yeah. That is very true in the in the logistics industry. So uh, we work with companies that put service before price, but uh, with our market visibility, we can really get the rates down. I mean, our average client sees a 10 to 15% reduction in the first year. It can actually be as high as 30. I've had people have 40% reduction because they were a smaller company and they were just being taken advantage of, quite honestly. Gotcha. All right. So, Joe, before I let you go, um, I understand that uh, Global gives a free analysis. So, you know, we all love free things. So tell us about a free analysis that you all provide. Well, it is exactly free. The only cost to you is taking the time to get us copies of paid freight bills for a period of time. If you're a large shipper, uh, we recommend one to two months. If you're a seasonal shipper, we recommend your medium busy time, your extremely busy time, and then maybe when things fall off a little bit Mm -hmm. for a good analysis. But what we do is we go in and we look at your program. Uh, We benchmark it to what we know we can negotiate on your behalf. And by the way, our contracts that we negotiate are in our client's name. They're not in our name. Gotcha. So that's important because the client owns the contract, not us. Right. Wouldn't that be more of a third party person if uh, the contract was in their name? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. There's the difference exactly. right there. So once what, what we do, we benchmark it. We look to see, you know, what based on our market visibility, what we think you should be paying. Oh, we also look at uh, mode utilization. Are you using... LTL when you should be using parcel? Are you using parcel when you should be using LTL? Right. Do you have partial truckloads that maybe could go LTL? Or maybe you have large LTL shipments that could go partial. And so uh, we look at all that, and then we come back to you and we sit down and share the result. So if it's cost beneficial and it makes business sense for both of us to engage, we will come back to you with the results and a proposal. If it doesn't make sense to do it and it's not a mutual you know, benefit, 
we'll go back to you and we'll give you some pointers on what you could do to sharpen your own program. You know, our, our director of operations, you say it's a checkup from the neck up. Gotcha. And that's exactly what we do. So you have a, a group of outside people with over 235 years of experience, a lot of which is on the carrier side. Uh, looking at your program and signing off on it or letting you know that it needs improvement. Fantastic. All right. Well, again, they can find that uh, by connecting with you at g-l-i.com. I'll also uh, have your uh, uh, direct link to you in the uh, in the show notes. Well, hey, Joe, I, I truly appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with me today and uh, you know share some of your uh, many, many years of, uh, of wisdom in this, uh, in, there, in this field. Well, thank you, Jason. You know, uh, I appreciate our friendship over the years, and I think that I've learned a lot about distribution by uh, working with you, and you've learned a little bit about logistics by talking with me. So I think it's, uh, it's a good, mutually beneficial relationship. There you go. All right, my friend. Well, you take care. Good to see you as always. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, consider hitting that subscribe button. Links to sponsors, products, and services mentioned during this episode can be found in the show description area on your podcast application or at www.distributiontalk.com. Distribution Talk is edited and mixed by Andrea Klunder and Edwin Ruiz at the Creative Imposter Studios. This episode was brought to you by my company, The Distribution Team. We are a consulting services firm dedicated to helping wholesale distribution clients remove barriers to profitability, generate wealth, and achieve personal goals. To learn more about how we can help your company succeed, check us out at www.thedistributionteam.com.